So um, my name is Fabian. I started Mali Spoon um, uh, four years ago. Um, and so at Mali Spoon, we're bringing delightful, market fresh, and easy cooking back to the people. So we want to make it easy to, for people to cook. Because when you think about it, now you walk in a supermarket, and you're seeing all the ingredients there, like the meat, the fish, the vegetables, everything is there. And um, you could cook anything you like. But when you leave the supermarket, at least for me, I always wonder, um, why is it that I always end up cooking the same things, like steak with broccoli or steak with green beans, no? So we feel like let's make it easier for people to cook, because people don't want to cook the same things. Uh, it would be nice to cook things like, I don't know, salt and bokka with uh, sugar snap pea and uh, polenta mash. It's actually quite easy to do. When was the last time you cooked like that? Or um, like a chicken supreme on um, a lentil bed, this nice um, uh, sour cream around it. That's yummy. No, it's not that hard to do, actually. Or like a pork mole with um, avocado and rice around it. I mean, why do people not cook like that? And actually, our customers cook like that every week. In fact, we send 14 and a half million meals like that to our customers over the past couple of years. So um, in a way, we want to make it very easy uh, for people to cook. Um, and so how does it work? So we have chefs, and our chefs create 12 recipes every week. And then you, simple as just picking what you want to cook, you just select what you want to have. You tell us how many times per week you want to cook with us, two, three, four, five times a week. Um, you tell us how many portions you need, what's the best day you would like your box. And then we send this box to you. And in that box, you have all the fresh ingredients, the recipe card, everything you need for cooking. The only thing you need is salt, pepper, and oil. Everything else, we ship to you. And uh, people love it. I mean, it's not only nice to cook from scratch compared to eating a frozen pizza. No, it's healthy. It's also nice to buy it for your family. But when you ask our customers what they love about it, they say, my life's already busy enough. I've got too many things to worry about. And so what are we going to cook tonight is not a problem that you have to think about anymore. We really take care of that for you. Now, look, we are in the grocery space, which is crazy. I mean, how? How do you think you can compete with supermarkets? In fact, my father still says, Fabian, I'm not getting what you're doing. I mean, supermarkets, a lot of competition, low prices. Why on earth would you want to compete with supermarkets? Well, there's two things I like about the grocery space. Number one, it's very big. In fact, people spend more money on food than anything else. So maybe your rent or your mortgage comes first, but food is pretty big. It's also the last vertical to switch from offline to online. We have this channel switch. I mean, over the last years, we had multiple industries to go from offline to online, like fashion is 20% online, uh, um, electronics is 30, um, toys is 40% online, and this had a big impact on, on offline retail. Think about Toys R Us, no? it's gone. Or borders, doesn't exist anymore. Shopping malls, dying. Because you have all this infrastructure there, and then the sales go from offline to online, and the utilization comes down, and suddenly you don't have a business anymore. So I think in groceries, which is a low-margin industry, if the channel switch is not 20, 30, 40 percent, if it's just 10 percent of sales go from offline to online, I don't think the business model works, which luckily is not our problem, because we're not a supermarket, actually. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use this channel switch situation to build large consumer brands over the coming years. Now, let's talk about supermarkets. This is what you think looks a supermarket. like. You see all these fresh ingredients there on the shelf. It's beautiful. You can pick up everything. Obviously, the supermarket doesn't know what you need. That's why it's all there. But I think that's the wrong way to think about supermarkets. I think that is a better way to think about supermarkets. That's what a supermarket looks like. Everything is thrown out. In fact, supermarkets have to throw out up to 30% of the fresh products that you see in the shelf. Because a supermarket, like any other retail business, the core business process is I source to stock, and then I sell from stock. And if the stock is perishable, it's a disaster. They have to waste it. And of course, that's a cost. Somebody's paying for that waste, which, congratulations, it's you. It's priced up. No, it's marked up. Um, it's also, by the way, pretty bad for the environment. I mean, think about all the, the, the resources that go into agriculture. 70% of the fresh water that we use on planet Earth is not us showering or washing our cars. It's going actually into agriculture. Or the majority of methane emissions has been generated by agriculture. So we've got this 
Massive industry, which is growing things on fields, using a lot of resources, and 50% of what we grow on fields, we will throw out. Because the supermarkets throw it out, you throw it out, on the supply chain is throw out. It's crazy. Now, let's talk about us. We're not a supermarket. We're not a retail business. We're actually a manufacturing business. We love manufacturing. We are like Procter & Gamble, Unilever. Only that, unlike these guys, we don't sell to retail. We sell straight to the customer. And what that does, it changes the supply chain from a source-to-stock supply chain into a source-to-order supply chain, meaning we only buy the food we've already sold. So our food waste is not 30% like in supermarket. It's actually less than 1%. We don't have any food waste. So we have this unfair advantage of a supermarket of having much higher margins, because this 30% waste we don't have. So our customers select what they want to cook. That informs what we need to create in terms of recipes. It informs the ingredients we need to source. We source them just in time into our manufacturing facilities, send them to the customer. We're doing this all over the world. We're operating in three regions, US, Europe, and Australia. Uh, Australia is actually our largest region. It's our most mature region, where we're already breaking even, EBITDA break even right now. We'll be profitable, actually, throughout the second half um, of this year. And there's 177 million households that can buy a Mali spoon box today. Think about it. How many supermarkets do we need to build to um, serve 177 million households? No? 10,000. We have eight facilities all over the world. Two in Australia, three in Europe, and three in the US. Now, I could tell you lots about the business and how beautiful it is. In the end, you always have to look at the unit economics to see whether you have a business. And I think this is interesting, because at any consumer-facing business, it's always the same. What does it cost you to acquire a customer? When you have your money back, what's the ROI? And here, and by the way, as a rule of thumb, I think if it takes six to 12 months to get your money back, I think you're in good shape. If it takes longer, too much cash to burn. Now, at Marley Spoon, we acquire a customer for 69 euros. We get that money back after six months. I mean, that's a rapid payback period. More importantly, our ROI is 3x, so we can invest a dollar, and we get $3 back. So we found a machine that allows us to invest $1 and return $3. It's a 40% IRR, and this is not a small margin uh, a small niche business. This is cooking, groceries, the largest vertical of consumer spending. And by the way, if you benchmark this with many other consumer-facing businesses, it's actually better. It's better than Zalando. It's better than Wix. Better than Just Eat. It's not only better, it's also much bigger. People spend more and more money on food and cooking than on buying shoes, actually. So it's quite exciting that this business model, on a per-user basis, is quite sound. Now, it's not only sound on a user economic basis, it's also growing fast. So we grew 160% year over year from 16 to 17. We're forecasting that we're going to grow 75% in the current year. But when you grow fast, the question you always ask yourself, um, does your fixed cost also grow fast? Because you only have a nice business when the top line grows and fixed cost is kind of flat. You, know? you call it operational leverage. Now, the nice thing is here, as the business grew from the first half 16 to the second half 17, 4.7x, our GNA just grew 60%. No? I mean, that's massive operation leverage. If you compare the first half 17 to the second half 17, the dark gray bar doesn't move anymore. It's flat. No? So this is why this business, while it's still very small, 93 million in sales, it's nothing. It's like a large supermarket or two supermarkets. We're already at the point where this business becomes profitable. In fact, Australia is our first region. It's break-even as we speak. It's going to be EBITDA profitable throughout the second half this year. Um, and globally, every year, we've halved our EBITDA margin. Negative still. But actually, we're going to get this company into profitability in the back end of the second half, 2019. So we're actually in the process of bringing this company um, into profitability. Now, if you sum it up, when you think about it, we offer you to cook 10 times better than the supermarket. And today, it's the same price. But we are very small. We have no economies of scale. Think about it. What happens if we would get to scale? I think then we should be able not to just offer you 10 times better than the supermarket, but also cheaper. This will be much cheaper than cooking with a supermarket. And then I don't think there's any reason 
if you're cooking anyway four to five times a week, to go to a supermarket. Thanks so much for your attention.